Hello, everyone, and welcome to this training session entitled Public Affairs, an Important Tool for Competition Authorities. I would like to start by thanking the ICN, the International Competition Network, for sponsoring this conversation, and above all, uh, the five competition authorities uh, which have taken part in it. I'm the Chair of European Public Affairs at the Brunswick Group, based in Brussels, uh, and when I began working in the competition field some 40 years ago, uh, competition authorities were dominated by lawyers with a few economists. But in recent years, uh, there has been a growing recognition of the importance of public affairs as well uh, as an important uh, and powerful tool by which competition authorities uh, go about uh, shaping uh, the agenda and explaining what they do uh, to uh, their various stakeholders. We will be joined in this session by five leaders of competition authorities from Belgium, Brazil, Japan, South Africa, and the United Kingdom. And I'm very grateful to them uh, for uh, joining us. Uh, authorities today use public affairs to explain what they're doing to their constituencies, uh, which often include parliaments, ministers, and of course, uh, through the media, uh, the general public. And of course, on the other side, competition uh, authorities deal with companies after all. Companies are also using public affairs increasingly to explain and to promote, sometimes to defend uh, their own positions uh, to the same audiences. So throughout this hour long session, we'll be talking about the role of public affairs in competition cases today. This training session is divided into two modules. The first will provide an overview of what public affairs uh, really mean, how competition authorities around the world plan and execute their strategies. And in the second part, the second module, we will discuss the role of public affairs in influencing the media. Uh, in uh, each interview, the five competition leaders that we brought together will explain how they use public affairs uh, in support of their own agendas, in addition, of course, to real world examples of how they have done so uh, successfully uh, in their own experience. So I think this will be uh, a series of interesting insights into uh, the way public affairs uh, are used uh, in uh, the competition world, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, and really the first question is, how does your authority uh, plan and execute its communications or public affairs uh, strategies? Uh, uh, and how do you train your staff for that purpose? Well, thank you, Jonathan. First of all, it's a great pleasure to be with you. And I think this is a really important and helpful, helpful initiative. I think, first of all, we see public affairs as being as being hugely important. And, and I think there are three reasons for, for that. First of all, the CMA, I mean, as with many other competition authorities, does have a statutory function of, of advocacy to provide advice to, 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 to government. And so it's important that we are able to, uh, to, to engage with policymakers on this use of competition and, and, and consumer protection. Secondly, uh, we are set up um, as a result of legislation. Uh, and so it's important that we are accountable to legislators, that we make ourselves available uh, to explain the work that, that, that we're doing. And thirdly, uh, there's an awful lot that I think we can we can learn from policymakers, and I think in particular from from elected officials uh, when we're identifying um, areas of consumer detriment that we should be addressing. Now. A lot of our work will stem from, um, you know, for example, merger cases that are, that are notified to us, um, complaints that are made to us by, by market participants. Um, but we tend to hear less directly 
um, from ordinary consumers. So it's, it's hugely important for us uh, that in order to be able to identify areas of consumer detriment, that, that we engage with people who do have an insight to that. So, so it, it, is, it is actively helpful to us uh, to be able to engage with, uh, with members of parliament, so to, to learn about the issues that they're facing in their constituencies, in their districts, um, and also the, the various different consumer advice and advocacy organizations as well. And that plays a phenomenally important role um, in, in feeding into our pipeline process and making and making sure that we're working on the, on the areas that, that that will really have the biggest impact for consumers. And you, I, I think, from my perspective, at least, increasingly, um, the agencies has also have also become public affairs actors in their in their own rights. And the Belgian authority is definitely a very active actor on on that uh, on that scene. Can you give us a sense of how the Belgian authority, you approach what we would call a public affairs or a communication campaign around um, cases or more specifically issues um, that you want to embrace, that you want to work on? And perhaps give us examples of um, your, your best success, let's put it this way. <laughs> I think you, you, we there have to make a distinction between the domestic scene, the Belgian scene, uh, and the EU and, in, and, and international. Uh, on, uh, on the domestic scene, when we try to, uh, to go out and, and uh, defend uh, and explain um, what competition policy and competition law aims at and, and why we think it is uh, an important contributor, uh, the, for us, the most efficient has always been to, to uh, seek partners. We, we are too small to have all the experiences inside. And even if we have, uh, you, you, you have to reach out to sectors, to, to companies uh, who are not necessarily uh, very familiar with, with competition law and, and competition um, authorities. And, and I can give two examples. Uh, one of the main problems facing by certainly competition authorities in, in, in smaller member states, where the overwhelming majority of, of enterprises are small and medium-sized enterprises, who individually may not have a huge impact, uh, but collectively have. And if uh, they are not convinced uh, of the need to comply, uh, with, with competition law, you will never have a competition culture. And if you have no competition culture, you will not have the benefits of competition. Hmm? Uh, so seeking partners, and for SMEs, uh, we have at least uh, one of uh, SME organization uh, that is very active, very well organized, and, and very constructive, and always eager to do things uh, with us, and we to do things with them. So partnerships is, is the key. Uh, another example, uh, in a very different, uh, public procurement. There it's the adjudicating agencies and their coordination uh, levels, whether it is on, on the national level or on the regional level or, or local government in, in, in certainly the bigger cities, uh, which are also significant adjudicating uh, authorities. So you seek partnerships. Uh, what I'd like to discuss with, with Alexandre is how the Brazilian Competition Authority goes about interacting with the public through the media directly, uh, how it trains its staff to do that. Most of the competition officials I come across are, uh, are lawyers, are economists, aren't necessarily uh, people who have been trained in dealing with journalists and social media uh, uh, and radio and television, but more and more. That is what they are called upon to do. Alexandre, what does that, uh, what does that all mean uh, in the Brazilian context? Uh, hello, everyone. Hi, Jana. Thanks for the question. So uh, we focus on interacting with legislation and sharing the results with our work. And it is, um, it is economic and sociopolitical impact. So building a strong relationship with these politicians, engaging our stakeholders uh, and increasing our advocacy force efforts and uh, monitoring any issues that could um, affect competition. We also focus on engaging community leaders, associations, the press, regulatory agents, 
firms and civil society providing information and different uh, channels of communications, working with transparency and publicizing the results of our work through our official um, websites and other digital platforms as well. So uh, as we, as uh, by having a strong and open relationship with the traditional media outlets. Uh, furthermore, we have um, been working to use digital platform in our, in our favor. Social media platforms like Twitter and YouTube offer a powerful uh, new public forum for influencing how policymakers discuss the issues, uh, the audience cares about, uh, about it, and also how they regard them. Um, hence, nowadays, uh, nowadays, it is important to have uh, an online presence and we have aware of this fact. We are also uh, continuously working to make our official website more relevant and userly and user friendly. Um, how do you do it? Uh, what uh, what is uh, uh, from your point of view uh, your role in public affairs? How do you plan? How do you uh, execute your communication strategy? How do you train your staff uh, to do it? From my experience, I think the following two points are important. The first is to take initiatives that are closely related to people's lives, such as exposing price hikes during the oil crisis in the 1970s and the recent COVID-19 pandemic. The second is to work together with relevant ministries to reduce exemptions, recognizing the mutual importance of competition policy and regulatory reform. Given such a historical background, we believe it's also very important for competition agencies to do various peer activities to get support to competition policy from general consumers. The JSTC conducted a survey 10 years ago to collect information and opinions about the peer activities towards general consumers. The survey results show the significance of the peer activities for general consumers. The first question is, how does the Competition Commission plan and execute communications and public affairs campaigns for issues you are pursuing? The commissioner is the official spokesperson of the commission. He may, however, delegate uh, such role to a deputy commissioner, head of uh, various uh, work streams, namely advocacy, uh, cartels, measures, legal, economic bureau, uh, market conduct, as well as the commission's spokesperson. Our spokesperson in the main communicate decisions of the commission on enforcement of the competition policy, advocacy, and major control. After each and every weekly commission meeting, the commission issues a media statement uh, to communicate its decisions to members of the public. And how do you how do you react how do you react when uh, a company involved in in one of your uh, matters engages in a communications campaign? Do you react? Do you simply let them get on with it? Um, what do you do? So I think there were two important points here. So first of all, I mean, it's important for us as a competition you know, authority always to be independent and objective and to make sure that, that, that we are kind of resolutely focused on the evidence bef before us. Um, and, so, and so whether um, that is sometimes presented in sort of public um, sort of forums, in the media or elsewhere, uh, shouldn't at all detract from the focus that we have on that objective analysis of the evidence. So now you've talked a lot about partnership. Let me maybe take you in a very different, let's say, configuration. How do you interact? How do you engage with? Or do you simply react to campaigns that are, let's say, um, coming at an issue that you are defending as an enforcer, but um, from the other end, so opposing the very issues that you're trying to, to promote? How do you react to these? We're still in the domestic field. Huh? Uh, we have very little experience of, of anybody setting up any campaign um, to, to do something uh, we would prefer them not to do. Uh, <laughs> there, there has been um, maybe one example with regard to uh, coordination uh, 
mechanisms between hospitals uh, and then you try to convince the government of your view uh, and and see what is achievable and then coach them to uh, an acceptable compromise and do, do you sometimes find that the companies involved on the on the other side uh, are also engaging in public affairs campaigns in an attempt to influence you to influence the media uh, when that happens do you react uh, and if so how do you react yeah usually we don't um, we don't get uh, in this kind of dispute or um, or we don't attack them just protect competition is is it's a completely different approach so and sometimes it's very clear because the sector is unit and they want to go to the Congress and say, okay, we have to change this law because we'll benefit a part of the uh, economic sector, but we'll cause some problems for the rest. And you know that it's not a, it's, a, it, it will cause some harm for the, to the competition. So what we do is we, we, we do our job that is show to the Congress the impacts and the problem that this kind of law or this kind of um, uh, uh, this kind of uh, whatever is uh, the public affair uh, campaign they're trying to do will will cause harm to the competition. Say so, this is not good for the country. Maybe it's good for the sector, but we are we have to think about the big picture here. So the big picture is, and usually. We go there with some economic study, some a very strong opinion about the competition. Uh, when there are, as you rightly say, more than one policy area involved in the consideration of a particular issue, there is competition, but there is environment or sustainability or uh, a whole range of labor policies, uh, defense policies even, uh, you will find a broader interest in a particular issue than simply what economics and law tell about competition. Do you engage in a public debate or do you just deliver your evidence into the system and then see what happens? Well, it depends. Uh, sometimes I just uh, deliver the evidence and our opinion but sometimes there is a, a, a public hearing that we, we will be part of and we discuss the issues and we talk, we explain why this should be good or not good for the competition. Uh, but it, we know that uh, it's a big country. There is a lot of interest, sustainability. So, and this is a political decision. Um, the society has to know uh, which is better uh, for them. So it means that maybe they will... Uh, create a regulatory, regulatory, whatever it is, but it's race buried to entries. But I, we, I keep saying this is not good for competition, but okay, but I have two issues here and I will, you know, I look in this, this time more for labor or more for whatever uh, sovereignty, whatever it is, and competition will be, you know, I put uh, aside and for the second you know, second level. So it depends. It depends what the country wants, the politician wants. But our job here is defend the competition. So every time that we are, they are calling us to go to the Congress or whatever it is, we say, okay, guys, we we uh, regarding to the competition, this is the best thing to do. But what about the labor? What about the sustainability? This is not my job. This competition is my job. And how do you react to communications campaigns from opposing those opposing an issue on which you're working? The communications team uh, devises means uh, its strategies and plans. And this may include the following communication interventions. interventions. These may be uh, targeted media engagements, uh, which include one-on-one -on -one interviews with senior editors so as to ensure that there is a better understanding, an extensive understanding on the work the commission does. As some, as some journalists sometimes uh, get it wrong. Uh, we also uh, issue out opinion pieces, either through um, uh, publications who may have an interest on the matters that are under discussion, or we may do so by 
uh, buying media space uh, on print and online media. We also engage in targeted uh, stakeholder interfaces. Uh, just recently, the, communication, the, the commission uh, uh, engaged key stakeholders in the automotive uh, industry, uh, mainly to raise awareness on its guidelines, uh, which came uh, to effect on 1 July 2021. Thank you. Now, you are a big country, of course. Uh, some of the colleagues watching us uh, are from much smaller countries, smaller jurisdictions, uh, and they will be interested. I was talking, for example, to your Belgian colleague, the president of the Belgian Authority recently, uh, about how they go about this challenge. Uh, how do you, uh, do you handle the relationships with the press yourself, or do you have a spokesperson? Do you train all your staff? How does it work in practice? Uh, Jonathan, actually we do both here. We have a, um, a press unit that help us with the press. So they have a lot of contacts and be in touch with all those journalists. And many of those demands also come through the, the press unit here. but. Uh, but anyway, uh, we can also talk directly to the press. In some cases, uh, they, they come to Kaji and ask directly, even the president and also the commissioners, they have uh, you know, kind of freedom to talk directly to the press. But usually all of those demands come through the unit press. That is more easy to control and understand what, is, what they want, really they want, what kind of information. Sometimes there's a lot of information and, and we have to put all those informations together and pass the information in a way that we can really be transparent, clear, and not give, give them any mistakes about the information that you wanna, you wanna give to them. So in the International Union, the Department of Economics, and also the whole body of Kaji, it's always, uh, they are always being trained uh, with uh, uh, good good courses, with uh, in company courses, and also we send them outside to study and graduate more and more. Thank you. And uh, in your country, um, in the public affairs arena, who are the big stakeholders? Who are who are the people whom? Uh, the parties you've just described on any side of a particular issue are seeking to influence? Well, when it comes to individual individual cases, um, we'll be focused very much on you know, analysing the evidence before us, irrespective of, of, of what sort of takes place in, in sort of a wider sort of media or, or, or political arena. I think when it comes to, to our engagement with policymakers and in public affairs uh, sort of more, more broadly, um, it's important for us to, to engage directly with the, you know, with, with the government, um, be it with ministers or officials. Uh, and often that is, that is through our statutory advocacy function and giving advice to, 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 to them. Uh, we're also engaged with... Um, um, uh, members of select committees that, that scrutinise our work and, and, and look at issues as relevant to relevant to us uh, and to individual parliamentarians as uh, as well. Can you can you think of a particularly successful uh, public affairs campaign where you you said to yourselves we've really managed to get that over? Uh, explain to people that competition is not simply a technical. Uh, backwater of uh, uh, of public policy that makes a real difference to people's lives. I think that the, the activity of which I'm most proud is is our work during the COVID nineteen pandemic, where at the start of that um, there was you know significant concern about a range of possible competition and consumer uh, protection issues. And if you sort of you think back to, to that period in in March 2020, um, there was concern you know so could. Could competition law potentially be a, a barrier, for example, to um, uh, supermarkets ensuring that there was there was security of of, of, of supply? Um, uh, could there be um, uh, price gouging um, uh, on essential items? Uh, could uh, consumers' rights um, under consumer protection uh, legislation um, be um, 
sort of, uh, could companies fail to respect those the, those rights? Uh, so it was so what we did was was first of all to sort of bring together teams from across the CMA to identify what the the areas of possible concern as a result of COVID nineteen could be. But what we also did was for the first time to set up um, an online form uh, to enable anybody sort of across the, the the UK to get in touch with us about sort of um, uh, issues they were experiencing with businesses treating them unfairly um, uh, as a result of the the, the pandemic. And uh, we've had over 150,000 um, uh, contacts made on that that online form, and that was really useful in in helping us to prioritise our activity effectively um, and and uh, help us to to launch enforcement cases um, uh, where we thought that the companies were treating consumers unfairly. And, and as a result, we were able to secure um, hundreds of millions of pounds of, of, of refunds for, for, for consumers. And if we go now from the partners to the channels that need to be to be used in your in your experience, um, are there channels that are more effective than others? I get the feeling from your answer to my previous questions that you will say it very much depends on, on the issues, but maybe in your experience, what's most, most effective in terms of public strategy? And maybe do you have any examples uh, of where you say this was really effective and we got what we wanted, or at least we've put stakeholders on the track we wanted to? When it comes, when, when you're starting now with the, with the European level, uh, that is the the ECN, the ECN working groups, the the advisory committees, the the meeting of the heads of authorities. Uh, that yes, obviously. Huh? Uh, now, when it is still on the European or international level, when uh, new legislation is required, that means you the key actor is not only the Commission; it's also the Council and the Parliament. Uh, then you also talk to. Uh, to, to the ministry, right? because then the, the ministry represents Belgium in, in the council negotiations. Uh, we have very good direct contacts with the ambassador, the permanent representative, uh, and we brief uh, the uh, uh, Belgian members of the European Parliament. Uh, and you get feedback from some and not from others. And uh, so, so that 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 is uh, uh, more of a, a broader spectrum of uh, uh, people you, you you work with. The two yeah. most difficult have, in all the years I, I can talk about, basically being the small companies where you really depend on the sector organization. Uh, compliance programs, etc., with large, large industry are, I think, by and large, a success story. But to reach the smaller ones is much more difficult. And which communications channels and tactics should be used to create an effective public strategy in South Africa? And if you have any, any examples that you could share, that would be very helpful. And at the advent of the, the coronavirus pandemic, and in anticipation of the spike in prices uh, for essential products and healthcare products, such as sanitizer and face masks, the commission introduced uh, an SMS and WhatsApp hotline, uh, mainly to make it easier for members of the public to submit their complaints. And subsequently, the commission received an unprecedented number of complaints swelling to over 2,200 cases by March, 2021. You, you are obviously a uh, well-established, uh, experienced uh, organization in, in quite a large country. Um, let's try and think about a small uh, new competition agency, perhaps, recently set up or in a small country. Um, what, what would your advice be? And this must happen. People must come to London to talk to you and say, we're, we're setting up or we're changing the remit of our competition authority. What lessons uh, can we learn from you? What do you say to them? I think one of the really important uh, things um, uh, and valuable things to, to, to bear in mind is uh, that actually there's an awful lot that you can do in public affairs and communications without uh, significant budgets. And, and although we do uh, do sort of big paid for campaigns to increase awareness of competition law, uh, and I'm thinking of campaigns like um, uh, Cheating or Competing, which we've run over the last couple of years to, to increase awareness um, amongst um, businesses of uh, competition law, uh, 
um, and, and the importance of not engaging in anti-competitive agreements. Although we've done that and invested quite heavily in that, there's also an awful lot you can do without um, uh, significant budgets. And, and some of the most important things that, that, that you can do is to start off by developing a narrative of why competition matters. And, and, and that's something that you know, that we spent a lot of, uh, of time on of, of, of ensuring that, that we had the narrative and the messaging um, to explain in, in lay people's terms uh, what competition is, why it matters, um, and why our work therefore matters. And that's been really useful because we can then use that in, in, in speeches, in our media engagements and, 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 and elsewhere. Um, in Belgium, you still have structured interlocutors and because you're ideally placed in Brussels, you can also function on the European and the international level. But what would be your advice to a very small um, enforcer that like maybe to draw on some of the ideas that you've just floated, but doesn't necessarily have the same network or easy access to networks and the capacities as the Belgian authority? If you're in a network, use the network. Use the network. Uh, use the benefits and, and the programs like this of the ICN huh? uh, and of the OECD uh, uh, can, 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 can bring you. Use the available Uh, resources. Second, talk to your neighbors. Uh, it is very useful, I think, that neighboring authorities regularly meet and exchange experiences because they're probably operating in similar markets. Uh, and, and you then hear, ah, but this case, but this case is very similar to, to what you're not talking about. Maybe If you have that, seen that, I should look, have a second look and, and, and maybe see the same problem. So talking to neighbors, exchanging experiences uh, is probably even more important for small and young authorities than for, for more uh, richer or larger or uh, longer established. As Jonathan said in the introduction, you are an hyperactive authority. And I'd just like you maybe to share with us one campaign that you're particularly proud of, which started in Belgium and mushroom, if I may put it this way, at the European level. I have one in mind on pricing of certain consumer goods, but maybe you want to talk about, <laughs> about others um, because yeah. I think it's a very interesting dynamic. I don't claim that we were the first to discover that there is a problem with prices uh, in supermarkets. Um, but, but, but yes, you often heard uh, that things were more, ex more expensive in Belgium than in neighboring countries. Um, and when you made a point of that, you always got the message that you were comparing apples with peers. And, and, and frankly, Um, we were fed up with that, if I may use that expression, and therefore uh, organized a study where, uh, a study where um, uh, on the basis of barcodes, so that you knew that, that products were really identical, made for, for a very, very large number of, of, of products, a study comparing prices in Belgium and the neighboring countries. Is there a, a public affairs campaign of which you are particularly proud? Uh, you've just shown us one which looks pretty good. Uh, and what are the milestones which you build into that sort of campaign? Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the public affairs campaign that I'm particularly proud of is Uh, JFTC for one day. Uh, this event encompasses the lectures on the Anti-Monopoly Act for businesses, uh, consumer seminars, and the lectures on the Anti-Monopoly Act for students, set up booths for consultation and displayed peer brochures, etc., in one stop. It is especially effective as a public affairs campaign in the offices. Thank you. Hi, Stuart. It's great to see you again and to be talking to you for our second phase of discussions about the role of the media 
And as a former media person myself, I'm particularly interested to hear your take on um, the best ways of dealing with the media in, um, from where you sit in the organisation and look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Caroline. It's great to be with you. Great. So I'm going to kick off with an easy opener, um, which is just give us a sense of the media landscape that the CMA faces in the UK. Um, how complicated is it? What kinds of media do you have to sort of think about when you're thinking about the communication strategy? I think there are three broad sort of categories, I guess, in which we would think about the the, the media. Um, the first is the you know, the specialist competition press, and 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 these are these are the people who you know know the CMA as an institution, who follow our work very closely. They'll often also follow the work of other international competition or you know or, authorities, and and so uh, so we're quite experienced in in in, in all of in all of that. Um, uh, they will um, uh, read uh, well, as of you know decision documents and 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 press releases uh, so quite closely um, uh, and we'll often you know sort of know sort of many of our, our key um, our key staff and um, uh, and so when we're engaging with them uh, you're obviously assuming a little bit more a little bit more knowledge um, and uh, they will often be be going into the our cases in quite some detail the second category um, we tend to look at is the, I guess, the mainstream uh, press, from both sort of print and broadcast. Uh, and there uh, we've got sort of uh, outlets where there are journalists who probably aren't following our work on a, a day-to-day basis, um, but who, you know, every so often um, a high-profile case will, will come up or uh, an issue will emerge and, and which the, the CMA is being encouraged to, to, to act. Um, and, and they will want to engage directly, you know, directly with us. Um, and, and, and I think it's, it's really valuable to, to, to talk to that sort of broader kind of range of, range of media because they've got sort of that, 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 that reach. Um, uh, and it, but it also means that, you know, we, we have to make the effort to, to do a bit more to explain our, our, our work in, in much less technical ways. And then the third group that I sort of think about is when you're looking across kind of, sort of social and digital media, a sort of a wide range of, 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 of bloggers um, and, and activists who are engaging uh, with, with us directly um, uh, in non-traditional ways, um, and, um, but who it's, it, again, it's, it's very important for us to, to talk to. So depending on uh, the kind of um, outlet that a, a journalist is coming from, uh, the level of knowledge they have of the, the, the CMA and the type of issue that they're interested in, um, we can often engage in, in, in really quite different different ways. So Jacques, you, you talked about the front pages. How do you get onto the front pages? How do you reach the newspaper reader, the radio listener, the television watcher, the social media follower? You're doing this for him and her, for the consumer. Uh, Belgium is a complicated country. There are other ones around the world. You have uh, several languages. Uh, you have a busy international media uh, presence here as well, of course, uh, full of people like me who live here uh, and consume here and are interested in what you do as well. How do you uh, deal with the media? That's a very good question, and I'm not sure I have a very good answer. Um, when do you get media attention? By talking to them. Maybe we didn't talk in the right way, but I have, don't have, do not have the impression that that really uh, gets you close to the front page. What gets you close to the front page is sanctions having a case, maybe already dawn rates, but especially sanctions. You get attention by uh, certain types of action. That being said, uh, I think it is very important to be open. Uh, if, you are if you receive a call, be open about what you can do. Be open also about what you cannot do. And it is by giving um, real information, hard information on what you can give, that you get the credibility to be believed when you say that you cannot give information. And you build a, a, a relationship, you should not exaggerate it, but yes, a, a relationship uh, with a number of journalists. And you do that at the European level with the MLEXs and the PARs and the others, and I'm sorry if I do not mention all the relevant ones, 
uh, and you do that domestically, uh, basically with a financial press and with one or two uh, journalists uh, in, in the general uh, press that are really interested in economic uh, and competition issues. Uh, I, I would like to talk a little bit about, specifically about the media in Brazil. And uh, what do you think about the media landscape in our, our country in Brazil? It is kind of, it's a very complex, I think, but uh, I would like to know your opinions about the media. Yeah, um, so the media, for sure, uh, plays a very important role in each country. So it, uh, they are the, uh, the people that give us information and they have a lot of information because they talk to everybody. So what I, what I think about the media is um, some people think that the media sometimes is against the institution or, you know, trying to fight something that uh, could, you know, could give to the people, but it's, you know, it's a secret information. But I think for the other way, I think that media helped us a lot. And that's the way that the institution has, has to think. And, and um, regarding to to also uh, merging acquisitions and conduct, you know that uh, antitrust authority is not some, it's not very common to the common people. So the common people, they don't know what is CAGI means, what is antitrust authority, what we actually do, especially in Brazil. Uh, but when, when, we, we, you, when we use the media to talk to the people and to talk to the society, this is one of the important thing that we should do with the media. You know, pass our message and bring them to our site, a newspaper, television, uh, YouTube, whatever it is, any uh, uh, social media is for us, a partner it is very important to, uh, to be in a very good relation with them in order to pass a good message for the society. So, um, in, in this session, I'd like to discuss with you um, your relations with, with the media. Um, first of all, can I ask, what, what is the media landscape like in Japan? Uh, thank you, Daisuke. Uh, the JFTC maintains a variety of channels with the media. Uh, typical examples are the following. The JFTC holds ad hoc meetings with the chairperson. Uh, regular meetings with the Secretary General every Wednesday, uh, briefings to reporters by directors, including both pre- and post-press conferences in making public of specific cases, market studies, and so on, as well as the meetings with reporters at occasions like uh, JFTC for one day. Through uh, G channels, the JFTC tries to publicize its activities and the Anti-Monopoly Act. Thank you. What is the media landscape like in South Africa? Well, Marinda, while print and broadcast media remain prevalent in urban and rural South Africa, uh, online and social media are fast uh, becoming order of the day in how the public sector communicate to the public. Uh, our reporters are fairly uh, conversant with the competition issues but there are some who would obviously get it wrong. And for this reason, we would then embark on one-on-one -on -one engagements uh, with the senior uh, editors and journalists uh, at the various uh, media houses, just really to make sure that we enhance the understanding uh, of the media uh, colleagues on how the Competition Commission works. Just to bring that to life, can you give us an example of a particular announcement where you thought kind of um, quite hard about all the different complex ways you can launch it with different forms of content like video or an infographic? I think the example that uh, that I point to would be quite recently in our work on the, the, the pandemic um, and the, some of the announcements that we've made where we've been launching uh, action against companies who have been failing to respect uh, consumers' rights for, for, for refunds when they've been cancelling, for, for example, uh, holidays that they've not been able to take because of, of, of legal uh, restrictions um, uh, that, that have been put in place by, by governments. And there, what we wanted to do is to is is when we announced the action that we were taking, sort of set out sort of very 
clearly um, uh, the decisions that that we that we that we've made. Um, uh, Inform consumers of the rights that they had um, that they had got. Um, so creating, you know, sort of video content, um, uh, uh, sort of creating uh, fact sheets and other forms of information, so so that the so consumers have got the information that they they that they needed, um, uh, and 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 setting out also the messaging for businesses so that they're aware of the need of the need to, um, to 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 treat consumers fairly. So so as well as just creating content, we've also been actively engaging with uh, with businesses Business organisations with trade bodies, um, so the so that we can really get the get the message across um, about you know, the the obligations that they've uh, that they've got. Because I, I mean, what has sort of struck us throughout the, the the pandemic is that the vast majority of businesses that we engage with really want to treat consumers fairly. They want to do the right the right thing, um, and so uh, we want to make sure that they've got they've got the that that information to hand. And do you? Do you train your staff or do you do it all yourself? For the time being, our rule is that on investigations, only the competition prosecutor general, the auditor general, is allowed to speak to the press uh, and on all other matters, only my, me. Uh, for the future, um, well, it is certainly important that you uh, have a, a good coordination of the messages that go out. So for an agency which might be smaller than the UK and its access to, um, you know, different people to handle the media, just want to get your sense about just basic advice on how should a smaller agency think about developing stronger networks with the media and, and how can they make sort of good use of them in terms of those relationships? I think in the first instance, it's helpful to identify who are the journalists that are you know, sort of reporting on you regularly, um, because for, the, for most of the time, um, it's a, most of the work of, of, of competition authorities um, tends not to get a huge amount of media of media attention. Uh, so you can identify uh, from the specialist competition press, um, so who are the key people who are following following you across kind of national um, uh, media outlets, um, who are the people who tend to Port kind of sort of most frequently on on, on these, um, and then go through a process of first of all making sure that you're keeping these journalists up to date with your activity. Um, occasionally having those background briefings to, to to give them a bit more of an insight into comp in, into into competition issues, um, uh, and then and then also making sure that we're taking opportunities like speaking engagements to, to um, give um, uh, a wider understanding of the work of the of, of, of the of the, C, of the, C, of the CMA um, and some of that will be through when we launch our annual plan each year and we consult on on, on that that provides quite a good opportunity to engage with a, a wider a wider range of, uh, of state of stakeholders when you have an important announcement to make, uh, a decision or your annual report. I, I imagine you issue a report every year uh, of your activities. Mm -hmm. Do you hold a press conference uh, and take questions from journalists on what you have done and why? Uh, no, not yet. It, it, that might be an idea for the future, but it works a bit different in our case because the Association of Competition Lawyers organize every year a conference, which is very much on the annual report and the um, uh, priorities for the next year. And there you, fit, you, you meet the entire competition community. So uh, it's another example of partnerships uh, where, where others do it, uh, do, do, do it for you. Um, when uh, you take uh, uh, with regard to decisions, you, you issue a press release, and and whenever uh, the press picks it up, uh, you try to explain to to uh, as, as much as you're allowed to do uh, what you decided and why you decided it. Clearly, uh, you know Japan and the JFTC is quite uh, in, in regular contact with the media. How can uh, media officials, especially at smaller agencies, um, develop stronger relationships with media and use media to their advantage? Uh, thank you. I think it's important to provide polite and understandable explanations to reporters 
uh, continuing to provide general information to them will lead to deeper understanding of competition policy and the Anti-Monopoly Act. Thank you. What, um, in, in terms of um, developing that sort of relationship, um, what do you think the most effective tactics are when it comes to um, um, having developed that relationship, using media to leverage an announcement or raise the profile of, of agency officials? Thank you. And not only the presentation that the press conferences, but ex ante and ex post briefings to the reporters are important to deepen their understanding on the issues and to make their articles more appropriate and comprehensive. Also, the provision of the visualized charts of the JFTC's publication is useful for improving the visibility and also deepening the reporter's understanding. And just to get a sense of sort of how personal it is, again, the CMA has a lot of people. Um, how does an organization work out who should have the relationship with the media? Um, and how far can you, is it, is, is it for the role of the press team to have the relationship? So I just get a, want to get a sense of, you know, how do you decide who speaks with the media on behalf of the organization? Mm -hmm. So our press office will engage with the media on a day-to-day on a day -day basis. Um, um, but when we are... Um, uh, publishing an announcement on, on a major case. It may be that the, the decision maker, um, the director or senior director that, that has, been, has been leading that, that work might conduct an interview or a background briefing on that. Uh, occasionally, our chief executive and chairman and, and, and other members of our senior team um, might conduct sort of wider interviews or background briefings on the work of the CMA more, you know, sort of more, more broadly. So, so the press office um, uh, will will run it all, will we'll hold those relationships with the, with, with the media, um, but will then make sure that, that when we have got those big events coming up, we've, we've identified the right, pe the right spokespeople um, to represent the CMA on those particular issues. Now, what it means, though, is that, of course, the people who aren't in the press office uh, don't tend to have much experience of dealing with the, with the, with the media, uh, and so find it helpful to have that training to understand. Well, okay, how should you get, how should you um, uh, conduct a, uh, an interview with a print journalist? How should you um, uh, do uh, a radio interview? Um, uh, what are the differences between you know a background briefing and an on the record uh, in, in interview? And it's all those things that that it's important for the press office to make sure that those senior spokespeople are, 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 are trained in. And, and given the fact that, um, you know, in the past it was it was pretty hard for a journalist to get hold of lower level officials in the organisation, but now we have LinkedIn and the internet, it's much easier to find out who's doing what where. Um, one, if you have, you know, if you've received also advice about how should officials in the organization present themselves on social media or on LinkedIn and how far they should be aware of what they can and can't do. Is that something that you also have to think about quite carefully or have any advice on? Yes, I think there because there are a couple of things here. Um, first of all, uh, I mean, there is a point around around openness and, trans and transparency. So, uh, so we want to be actively engaging um, with uh, with the media and with a wide range of other of, of other of other stakeholders. Um, uh, but then there's also that point of of, of of propriety as well. So we need to make sure that um, that colleagues are aware of. Um, you know what's an appropriate way to 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 to, to engage publicly. Um, uh, that you know that if a journalist contacts you, then those queries should be referred to the press office um, in the first instance. Uh, and 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 also that you know because we are a public authority, um, it's it's incredibly important that we're always engaging properly. Um, uh, that you know that um, our uh, Announcements are released um, at the at the right time um, uh, to everybody at the same time that you that you respect issues around sort of both market sensitivity um, and confidentiality um, and and we take all of those things exceptionally exceptionally seriously. I think sometimes there can be a misconception that that um, good media engagement um, is about you know. Building the relationship, trading favors, um, and getting and getting good coverage as a as a result. I think I think for start that's unrealistic. Um, um, but also um, it's it, it's not necessarily appropriate for you know so for a public or, or authority. And and I think it's much more about ensuring that 
you make your case as effectively as you can uh, to the people um, who are, are interested in it and, and who need to, to know about it. So there's no there's no substitute for making sure that your messaging on a case is explained as clearly as possible. What about the more like uh, tactical things that you do on a daily basis to, to deal with media? What would be your advice for the kind of most challenging sub subjects with the media or dealing with the journalists, editors? What would be your kind of broader yeah. advice? Yeah, if I, if, I, if I mean, one good advice is have your internet, your um, press unit. And this press unit, you have to have a specific people to take care about uh, social media, like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, and also a specific people for journalists. They work completely different. So they have two completely different roles. So those has to reach, uh, those that working with social media has to reach the people over there. And, and this is different, different kind of uh, uh, different kind of people. I mean, it's young. They they know that what they want uh, through the social media, and they work with journalists. Have two kind of works, in my opinion. One is organize all the journalist demands, uh, and you can pass the information uh, like writing or we can talk directly to the journalist. Writing is more, sometimes is more secure because you get the, the, the questions and why write what you want. When you talk to the journalist, sometimes you don't know what is the really reason of the questions and you may talk too much or talk less. That's the important thing. So, and there is a strategy to do this in my opinion. And, what, and just looking back, obviously, you've been even just the experience of the same way more generally. Is there anything you think the organization um, has learned from in terms of previous mistakes or previous ways that it could have done better, if not a mistake, in terms of handling a communications, a bigger communications announcement? Just so, again, for the, some of the other agencies to learn from that experience. I think we've become much more open in the last in the last few years, I think that um, the CMA traditionally, I mean, as with many competition authorities, um, you, you're used to engaging with um, what's sometimes referred to as as, as the competition bubble um, of of the 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 academics, the advisors um, who um, uh, are heavily experienced in in, comp in competition, um, professionally in, in, in involved, um, and following to our, our work closely. I think we've realised over the past few few years um, that while that community is very very important. We also need to engage actively um, with um, with policymakers, um, uh, with you know, sort of business and consumer organisations, um, and indeed to be able to to be able to talk to to consumers directly. And I think that's been particularly important during the during the pandemic because because here we've been in a situation where competition issues have been directly affecting. Um, people's day-to-day -day lives uh, on on issues from um, you know allegations of price gouging to concerns about whether competition law might be uh, a, a barrier to supermarkets cooperating to ensure security of supply or or whether businesses are respecting uh, consumers um, uh, protection rights so uh, I think you know it, it, the pandemic has then really kind of I think shown the you know you know the value of of, of, of engaging directly Directly, um, and being and being much more much more open to, to a wider range of, of stakeholders. What advice would you give, in all humility, uh, to uh, to other competition authorities around the world when they when they come to visit you in Brazil or when you meet them in uh, conferences around the world? Uh, what what advice do you give them? How 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 should one run a modern competition policy? in today's uh, world of public affairs? Yeah, I mean, if, if, I, if I am in a position to give some advice, I would, I would, I would say that uh, uh, 
transparency is the best way to run an authority. It's, it's what I, I think. So you have to be alert what is happening abroad, what has happened in other jurisdictions, and also what has happened inside of your country with uh, the regulatory agents. You have to have a team to, cl to work close with them all the time to see what kind of regulation is going to that sector. If you can do some advocacy uh, uh, or and you know put your public uh, affairs and, and engage in some campaign to talk to them before they release the the the, the regulation, you know, and trying to adjust uh, any specific issues that would be important for the competition, and also a uh, very good relationship with the Congress, with public prosecutors, um, and 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 if you have that, if you have at least a minimum control of what is going on, we can in advance uh, understand the future problems that probably it's going to happen when they release some regulation or bill that is against the competition. Now that's very interesting because yes, I, I remember too, I received training and uh, later on I gave training. One of the most important lessons was to avoid, we all have jargon amongst uh, uh, amongst competition specialists, we all know what, I don't know, resale price maintenance means or cartel, uh, in, not in the sense of shooting and drugs. Uh, uh, we know what we mean, but people uh, who read newspapers and uh, follow social media don't necessarily understand. But if you explain what is behind it, you explain that resale price maintenance means that there is no competition uh, between uh, the sellers, the distributors, the supermarkets, because the manufacturers set the price. That everybody can understand. But uh, we have to find ways in our different languages to explain things uh, in, in an accessible, uh, without being patronizing, but in an accessible way. And then people, I think, understand that competition authorities are acting in their interest. 